Hi everyone, I'm coming at you this week from the uh, FJ Labs office in New York, uh, in Brady, New York. And um, this week I decided we're going to cover a topic that's probably one of the most requested we have. It's what makes for a perfect pitch deck? Like what should you cover in what order? What should the story be? How long should it be? I mean, literally every founder has, especially first time founder, has these types of questions. And uh, we see so many pitch docs that uh, we actually do have a perspective. And uh, joining us this week will be uh, Kelly, who's the head of platform at FJ Labs. And actually one of her main roles is helping the portfolio companies fundraise. And I'll let her get a little bit more into what we do and how we do it. And uh, as a result, she's seen so many of these that uh, she has a very clear perspective. So without any further ado, let's get started. Welcome to episode 21, How to Build the Perfect Pitch Deck. So, Kelly, uh, thank you for uh, joining us this week. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself a little bit, and uh, we'll take it from there. Great. Thanks, Fabrice, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this week and joining Fabrice in so many weeks and so many interesting topics. As Fabrice mentioned, I'm FJ's first head of platform. I've been with the team full-time for almost three years now. And when I joined, when we were identifying the strategy for how we could support 500 active portfolio companies, one of the recurring messages was around fundraising and helping founders consolidate and pitch appro appropriately so that they can get back to actually building the business is just really what they want to do, um, had a symbiotic relationship with the way that FJ approaches investing. Because we don't lead and we don't take board seats, we have existing relationships with venture capital firms. So for the portfolio, we do a number of things when they're ready to raise. We review pitch decks, we help them identify what key messages, um, how to pitch their story appropriately, but we also then help them decide who to talk to. We make those introductions, we help back channel, we try and condense the fundraising process as much as possible to get them back to work. Cool, uh, well, thank you for the intro. So maybe we should talk or, 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 or go specifically into, you know, I guess today's topic, which is uh, how to build a perfect pitch deck. Do, do you think there's many ways to build a pitch deck? Or do you think there's really like a, kind of set the fault path that people should be following? It's a great question. It, it depends a little bit on your stage and also your own comfort level. I always remind founders that we can give you a layout and we'll go through a layout today. But at the end of the day, if you're not comfortable with it, that's the most important thing. So often what I recommend is pitching your own story to yourself, to your team, to your co-founder and building the deck around how you think the best flow is. Okay, that makes sense. So uh, why don't we get started on today's topic? Great. Okay. Well, first things first, should you even be raising, right? So in Fabrice's first episode, he talked about sort of the, the barometers that we see in the market around when to raise your seed, when to raise your A, what kind of multiples you're looking at. So first and foremost, you should sort of identify what the potential is, right? If you think you can go out and raise 20 million, but you're doing 50K in monthly GMV, should probably take a step back before you think about fundraising. Okay. The next, the next few things is um, the most important, right, is your cash position. So you want to be in a place of leverage when you go out to investors. If you have three months of cash and the average fundraise takes three to four months, you're not going to be in a position to walk away from any offer that you get because you're going to be desperate to get cash. The second is obviously the time of year. Um, the most popular times and the most busy time for me is right after New Year's and right after Labor Day, right? People have come back from vacation and they're ready to go. In the U.S. in particular, we're just a little bit slow between Thanksgiving and New Year's Eve because it's really a six-week period where there are a ton of holidays where you're going on. If those things are great, right, you have a ton of cash and you can decide to raise either New Year's or Labor Day, you, should, you could think about it from a seasonality perspective. For instance, we have a few construction companies in Canada. Um, there's a lot more construction going on in Canada in the summer and the fall than there is in dead February. So they may want to raise as there is a peak in their seasonality than the trough. Once you sort of decide you're going to raise, uh, we spend a lot of time supporting our portfolio companies on how to actually structure it 
this is an Airtable that we use internally to actually help our portfolios track um, what introductions we've made. But you should put together a list of who are your ideal investors. Do they lead? Um, how important are they to you? And you should send this to your friends, your co-investors, other people in your network to help you get warm intros. The warmer the intro, obviously, the more likely the conversion. Yeah, I, I actually, I'd add a so few things. I mean, you should totally run a process. It can't just be you're having ad hoc conversations because if you do that, you will get offers, but then you're not going to be optimizing the right partner, the right valuation, et cetera. So once you've decided you want to raise, which I think as Kelly pointed out, it's like uh, eight months before your cash out and you have the right traction. So those are, are collectively required. It's not just you're out of cash. Let's go raise. Uh, you should actually put this together and, and it's everyone that you should be talking to. It has to be the right VC for your stage and that invests in your geography, in your category, and is not invested in a competitor. So it actually eliminates a lot of VCs from that from that universe and that we can make intros where you may have these relationships with other people that are investors and you may have these relationships, but it has to be reasonably targeted. Right. And you definitely, to Fabrice's point, you definitely want to go out all at the same time, right? Because you want to create a sense of FOMO. You want to make people interested in you. And so having pre-conversations when you're six months away from raising or allowing some of that preemptive chats to happen can be actually detrimental to what your valuation could be or how much money you could raise. So all things to keep in yeah, mind. Yeah, unless they're conversations just to build the relationships, like people you don't know, you want to start like getting to them to know you, be comfortable with the idea, et cetera. But just make sure that you're not trying to create a, or they you don't let them prevent the process because otherwise it's okay, but you're not going to get the best outcome. So moving more towards the conversation while we're here, which is around the pitch decks, right? Just a few etiquette questions, right? Which is don't send me a deck longer than 20 pages. Um, I don't need everything. It's overwhelming. Uh, follow basic PowerPoint etiquette, right? You have your page numbers. You should cite where your sources are. Um, again, to the first point, right? Make sure that your deck is how you want to tell the story. Actually, don't I'd let us something push else. you around. Send a deck. Some people send like business yeah. plans. So they're like 50 page yeah, documents. That's the last uh, one. Uh, it, do, we, we don't want to review a business plan. A deck is, is great because it actually prepares a story. And what's interesting is internally in the way we're going to create a, a, an investment memo, you want to send it the equivalent of our investment memo, that's fine too. But I would still want the deck because we want the story of what it is you're building. And so I don't like one pagers. I don't like, uh, definitely don't like 50 page business plans. Where, uh, I'm happy to see a model, by the way, but I want to see the deck. Yeah, I don't want to see a teaser deck. I don't want the five-page version when I could have got the 20-page version. Put it on a doc send, have an expiration date, but don't hide it. We're all going to get it. Um, it makes you it makes you an easier partner from the beginning. The caveats here, and we'll go at, a little bit into this at the very, very end, right? But the deck we're going to show is, is our sweet spot, right? So a seed Series A deck. There are changes that you can make in pre-seed. Obviously, you're not going to spend a lot of time on traction. You haven't launched yet. At later stage, you're going to be responsible for a lot more financial information, even in the deck, along with probably sending a more substantial data room. Yeah, but at pre-seed, I still want you to have thought through unit economics. So even though you're not live, I still want you to be able to articulate how much you're going to charge to whom, what do you think it looks like based on, on market metrics? Now, obviously, the difference is it's only theoretical. If it's actually, if you're live, it's going to be actual unit economics and actual traction. And if they're not great, how you're going to get them to be great. I think that's a great point. So this is just basic, right? So here's kind of the structure and format and the number of pages that we generally see people go into on each one. Um, so it's so right, so about we'll 20 slides, in. more or less? About yeah. 20 slides. Could even be 15. I love a short deck. <laughs> All right, so the title page, right? I mean, this is pretty obvious, but you should say what you are at the very beginning. And if you can't synthesize it down to we are X for Y, Maybe you should take a step back and think about um, if you're really ready to fundraise. Yeah, many that. people send us the, the deck and it's just the name of the company. It's great if on that first page, we understand what it is you're trying to do. Yeah, you're trying to hook someone. It's a sales pitch, right? Okay. The most natural way to start, right, is to introduce yourself. It would be very hard to have a conversation where you're spending seven minutes before you even say your name. So the team slide here is a great way to explain who you are, 
your background and why you're so excited about this opportunity. So on the left here, these are, by the way, these are all examples from real portfolio companies, real pitch decks that we've reviewed over time. Max founded, uh, previously had founded a Russian e-commerce site um, and raised over $100 million. And during that process, he recognized that import-export, um, which was kind of bread and butter for him because he was working with small e-commerce shops, was totally broken. And so there's this natural story of what he did in his past. He was six, you know, he has this really interesting, important background, and it led him to his next opportunity. Yeah, I think maybe that's one of the most common mistakes is not putting the team page first. People like sometimes get to the team and like page whatever. And but the thing is, especially your story as the founder CEO is the one leads to why you're building this. Usually it's a problem you face and you want to go and fix it. So it should be page one, because it's that story that leads to the issue. Totally. And and sometimes it's so enticing, right? A leader who founded Slice comes from a family of pizzeria owners, or Noah at Tread ha- also is from a family construction business. So it can be a great hook, and people will believe you more when you have a great story. Yeah, and in top. fact, what we want and what we look for and when we value the team is great storytellers. And so if your story is directly connected to what you're building, it's super compelling. Um, you know, it, it's okay to say, look, I did this market analysis. It's a big market as attractive margins. Therefore, I'm doing it. But it's even more compelling if you tell me this is a problem I faced my entire life, my family has faced, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life fixing it no matter what. And that's someone who has, like, passion. And besides, because they face the problem, they know how to go and fix it. Absolutely. And then you should tell us what the problem is, right? So here again is, is Tool BX um, based in Canada. They're building um, a construction marketplace and it's very clear, right? This is a big, clear problem. Suppliers don't have technical expertise. Less than 10% of building material suppliers sell online. And procurement is broken. Construction professionals are having to drive to pick up materials. They don't know how to get them delivered. So there's this really clear, old school, not techly innovated opportunity. Another way to do it, which Fabrice and I also really love, is contextualizing it, personalizing it, right? So telling the story of who you're helping. So for example, here is Unlock Real Estate, which is focused on triple net lease. Um, And you can say that Sally, who's the business owner here, she owns a veterinary clinic. She wants to expand but she is sitting on equity in real estate that she doesn't know what to do with. And she doesn't have other opportunities to expand her business and she's really frustrated. And so personalizing, contextualizing can really help and go a long way, especially when a problem is pretty thorny um, going down. Yeah, I mean, you usually describe the problem you face, which led to the idea, then you generalize that this is a problem everyone else is facing and we're going to fix it. And it's a huge opportunity, right? So here we're really look, we're talking about TAM um, and and the why now. So unsurprisingly, right, four hundred and fifty billion dollars are spent in retail construction materials. So already this problem of identifying this supplier and construction um, is already a clear problem, but it's also a really big one. And then the second one that's really helpful um, is why now. And so here with unlock right? There's historically low interest rates. We all know that. And so investors are looking for new opportunities. And so because of macro conditions, this this problem is even more enticing to solve. Yeah. And the way I would think of framing this is you want to be in a position to build a billion dollar company. You're not going to build a billion dollar company. Probably you shouldn't be venture backed, right? So the TAM you're looking for is probably at least 5 billion, probably even maybe at least 10 billion. But if it's not there yet, it may be okay. Uh, Maybe... By virtue of your execution, you will make the market to be that large. You know, think of uh, Airbnb, you know, sublets in major cities for short durations before Airbnb. I think that market was about a billion a year on Craigslist. But of course, it was missing all the key components. And and if you had done the math, you said a billion, not compelling. But like, if we do all the following things, there are a lot of market indicators to suggest it might be a large market. For instance, the hotel market is, is ginormous or the vacation rental market is a $100 billion market. So there are ways to get to there, even if you're not there. But absolutely, because you want to be building a billionaire company, you need to address TAM, and it needs to be early, right? Like, so we're an amazing, we're the right team to do this because we faced the problem before. It's a general problem in a large category. And the time is now. (laughs) 
And so this is what we're building um, or have built. And so again, it should be a brief overview of what your business actually does, a little more clarity than what your title page is. And then also the vision, right? So we want to know that this is a you're not just you're not just going to work on what you've built now. You actually see this being a massive opportunity with lots of potential revenue streams and lots of ideas that you have. So you can see here, right, the operating system for material procurement. That's a much bigger vision and statement um, than solving delivery. Yeah, hopefully we're not being confusing. I mean, we're using examples from multiple different companies for different slides. Sometimes some will, yeah, like Tool BX, which is the procurement marketplace, will will we'll, we'll recur, but we're using examples from Unlock Real Estate, from Silverbird, from Head Out. So we're picking and choosing to give different examples of how different companies have tried to address that slide uh, in, in in the storytelling. But obviously, you know, you, a full deck would be uh, completely cohesive with one idea and not covering four different ideas. Yeah, definitely. And so we've built this, so we've identified a problem, we know it's a big problem, we've identified a solution, and it's clearly already working, right? So here you're sort of implying that you've already gotten product market fit or that there's something compelling here that you want people to pay attention to. Because we mostly invest in marketplaces, it's often shown as GMV and revenues, but it could be MRR, ARR, revenue, churn, et cetera. Yeah, totally agree. And now let's dig into actually what the solution is and how it really works, right? So this could be a combination of potential workflows. So at the top, you'll see um, a pretty simple example of what a marketplace workflow would look like, um, or more generally about how a product is being built. Um, make it conversational, right? I don't love when I watch videos or testimonials. I want you to explain to me how supply gets on on board? How does demand get on board? How are you creating the transaction, et cetera? Yeah. And, and, and in fact, this goes to, you know, people, this is exactly what they're needing. And historically, the suppliers were keeping, uh, were managing everything in their spreadsheet, or frankly, they didn't even have a, a point of sale system or an ERP system. So we're giving them the tools to do it. I mean, explain what you're doing, why it's so much better than, than what was being done before, where, and, and, and make it compelling. Uh, maybe even give an example of a specific user that did it. Yeah, great. Competition, right? So not putting competition is hiding something. A lot of categories have a lot of players, and that's totally fine. What you need to explain to us is how you're differentiated, especially in a super crowded area right? It's not enough to say that we're just better. I want to understand why. And don't assume that people really understand the nuances, right? So for instance, we've seen an explosion, right, in, in real estate marketplaces in the US, but there are very clear differences between an easy knock model and a knock model and an open door model. But if you're not living in it every day, it can be, it can be not obvious. So really explain the nuance. Um, yeah, yeah. And help people understand. The way the under the hood companies could look very different, even though from the outside they could look very similar. Uh, Tool BX, which is the procurement marketplace, has another Canadian competitor. And from the outside, they look the same. You, if you're a general contractor, you can go, you, buy, you download the app, you can buy from both of them. But actually, if you dig deep into them, Tool BX is a marketplace. They are fulfilling on behalf of uh, companies like Lowe's or Home Depot and, and small providers. And, and they're and, and they're putting them online, whereas the other one is actually a vertically integrated player, more of an e-commerce store where they have their own warehouses, their own inventory. So actually, even though from the outside, or for a general contractor perspective, the business looks the same, from an actual underlying business perspective, it's completely different. And so actually explaining the nuances between the two and explaining why you're better or different and differentiated, there may be room for both or maybe not, but... Uh, really matters because most VCs are going to see so many deals, again, to Kelly's point, they probably don't know the difference and they may not even know who your competitors are. Right. And they may want to decide which is their, which is their horse to back and which, which model they feel more comfortable, right? Another example, we're, we're investors in Tundra, um, which is a B2B wholesale marketplace. Um, and the, there's another competitor called FAIR. And again, from the outside, they look really different. What's really interesting is FAIR has a transaction fee, 
Um, so they take 15% or whatever off the top of whatever you sell. Tundra does it differently. They let you buy advertising. And so they take nothing on the transaction. That's a really big difference in terms of gross margins or acquisition costs, everything. So again, just don't assume people know the difference because they're not, they've got a lot of deals to go through. Great. And now we want to know how you make money. So I love this example um, from one of our LATAM companies, right? It's showing what they do today. So today they, they take 12% on the transaction, but they're also going to be able to increase that margin or change the revenue streams going forward. And it's very clear. And from this slide alone, it makes sense, right? So private label products, we know that private label products have better margins. Um, and so they'll be able to take better margin on that. They'll also be able to expand categories. So they'll have more SKUs on their marketplace, which will provide more transactions, which will also give them maybe higher average order values. And then they can also have added on services. So a lot of times we're seeing a big trend, obviously, in marketplaces for, for really services on top of the marketplace. And so if you're helping them with warehousing or logistics or data, um, you're going to be able to continue to increase your revenue streams. Exactly. Or we're taking a small commission, but then we're going to do factoring and then we're going to do, maybe we do the last mile fulfillment, et cetera. So you can keep giving the story. It has to be realistic though. And it has to, with a somewhat expected timeline, it can't just be, and in the future, we'll figure out other ways to make money because other people do. I mean, it has to be very specific. Right. The dream, right, is not only to grow, but it's also to increase your revenue, right? So so the, the perfect deck is going to show not only are we just going to continue to expand our supply and demand and we're just going to keep going and going, but actually we're actually going to take more and more money from all of those transactions. That's a great story. And that's sort of what this implies here. And then unit economics. So this is something I see actually the least in decks and is the most important thing that I've learned at FJ, right? So when you get advice from me on how to build a deck, I am going to shove the idea that you should put your unit economics down your throat. Um, it's the most important KPI that we use in terms of identifying sort of the health of the business. And it doesn't have to be unit economics today, right? But we have to believe that the story is going to improve over time. I, said, so I would include two unit economics today, even if they're not great, and what they will be in the yeah. future. Don't just show me the dream. The reality of today matters a lot. And unit economics, I mean, the biggest mistake I think people make is they just show us revenues. They're like, or LTV to CAC on revenues to, to customer acquisition costs. That is not unit economics. Unit economics is on your contribution margin. So net revenues. Absolutely. Right. So in this section of your deck is a great opportunity to be really honest and to be really upfront. Um, and I think investors give a lot of brownie points for people who are upfront and give a lot of context here. So, right. Uh, unit economics should be really thorough. It should be your contribution margin. It should be your CM2. It should be your CAC bonus points for showing me paid versus blended, right? Because I can't give you money to necessarily grow your organic base. Um, and so we care a lot about this stuff. Cohorts, retention, especially if you're in a SaaS business, right? Logo churn versus revenue churn. Those things matter to an investor and putting it in your deck um, shows that you're a good founder because you're caring about the things that that really we think you should be caring yeah, so about. So as we evaluate founders, there's one, I mean, what we want is a founder who's a visionary, who's fantastic at execution and telling the story in a compelling way. That's on the visionary part, so the storytelling skills. But if you, to prove that you can execute, if you understand your business really finitely, very uniquely, like, you know, all the variables, you know exactly what are the levers you're going to pull to improve your economics. It shows that you understand the business and it, it gives us more faith and belief that you're going to be good at execution. And so actually, if you can actually, if you know your economics cold, if you know what will move them and how they will move in the future based on the different things and initiatives you're taking, it will increase your confidence that you're the right founder to do this. And so put them in the deck and know them cold and know exactly how, how to present it because this is how we are evaluating you. So this really goes for people whose economics might be underwater today, right? Because maybe you haven't gotten to the scale where you can decrease logistics costs or delivery. Right? We're, we can understand that, um, but we're not going to give you credit if we don't under if you're not going to tell us it. Cool. And then we're going to go into growth, right? So 
we've we've identified a problem, we've identified a solution, we've worked towards doing it. It's working today, both on a growth basis, but also on a unit economic basis, or it's not working on unit economic basis, but we know how to fix it, and this is how we're gonna do it. So we um, are going to add, you know, increase vehicle capacity so we can make more timely a delivery so our NPS goes up, so our repeat rate goes up, or we're going to um, add salespeople because now we understand how to sell the business and the founders no longer need to do all the business development. So really going into here, a lot of this ends up being about acquisition strategies, right? But what are you used today? How are you going to scale them going forward? Uh, if it's not just about growth and acquisition, how are you going to implement these new revenue opportunities, right? How are you going to increase margin? How are you going to build your private label products, et cetera? So think about what the VC, obviously it's called you know, it's venture capital, it's, cap it's risk capital, but you want to de-risk it as much as possible. So to the extent you've proven product market fit and what we're funding now is your growth, that's amazing, right? Like you have this fire and we're going to pour gasoline in the fire. And so the if you've proven that you have good unit economics, you're already growing nicely and you have a customer acquisition channel that works and it doesn't matter if it's a sales team, if you found a way to like hack, like and get more SEO, or if it's like paid marketing and Google, Facebook, or whatever, Instagram, and we're influencer driven, the channel doesn't matter. But if you have a channel that works, you know, economics that work, and we're just pouring gasoline on the fire, we love that. And so we want to fund your growth more than funding you finding product market fit. And you don't want to scale until you've actually found it. And so funding growth is exactly what VCs are here for. That's great. And at the end, this is your ask, right? This is why you're having this meeting. So I want to see a few things covered here. Um, what you're actually asking for, so the, so the dollar amount, you do not need to put valuation here. In fact, I encourage you not to put anything about that. Um, but you should also tell me how much you've raised to date. That's going to imply some sort of capital efficiency for me. And also going back to that very first slide, right? what your GMV is based on on how much you've raised to date and where you should be. Um, from who? So if you have a great investor table uh, or cap table, you should be proud of it. Uh, how are you going to spend this money? And where do you think it gets you? So you're going to hire 20 salespeople. Um, I want to know that you're going to 3x revenue in the next 12 months. Um, and then how much runway does it give you? So I can get a sense, again, of time to next raise. In general, you should not be raising less than 12 months of runway. We really like 18 months at least. Yeah, raise 18 months. And by the way, the expect there is a clear growth expectation from pre-C to C, from C to A, from A to B, both in terms of level of growth and duration. You know, we want to fund companies, you know, in, in like, let's say C, they're 150K a month in GMV for a market leasing 15%. You guys have 650K for their A, and there's an 18-month timeline, which is an implied growth monthly, month over month growth rate. Same thing. At your A, you're at 650. You want to go to 2.5 million. I mean, again, this is for marketplaces with 10 to 20% rake. So it's I'm not generalizing. It's maybe you could do it on a net revenue basis to generalize, but there is a clear expectations, and you need to show that you've been capital efficient to get it where you are, that you're raising the right amount for your stage relative to your traction to get to the next stage at the right level of traction that will allow it and it would allow you to raise money for the next round. Because you need to remember, at this point, you're not making money. And so we need to believe that if you're at the A, whatever you're doing with this money, you're going to get to a point where you're going to be fundable for the B. If you're at the C, you're going to get fundable for the A. We need to believe that. And if you understand exactly what people are looking for, the level of growth that's expected, that makes a huge, huge difference. All right. And that will also help you understand where your valuation will lie. Because not you're going to get, we're going to be assessed on a number of different things, right? First and foremost, opportunity in the team, but it's also going to be historical traction to date, how fast you're growing, um, how your unit economics look, but also a reasonable assumption about the future. And so, if you think you're going to grow 10x, <laughs> it's going to be a very different conversation around valuation than if you're growing 50% year over year. Yeah, and and of course, the more the later stage you are, the more it's going to be about the metrics that you've proven to date, and. Um... And, and something to keep in mind here is even if you're growing really quickly, I'd be careful on on raising a too high valuation because otherwise you're going to be priced for perfection. And if you don't deliver it, you may have to face a down round. You may not be able to raise the next round. I mean, there's probably one of the things that kills the companies the most is to raise too much money at too high a price, and then they don't grow into into that. And it's probably one of the most under 
thought of issue in terms of fundraising? And it's probably the number one reason that we don't follow on. So at FJ, we don't guarantee follow ons. We take every follow on opportunity as effectively a new opportunity. Knowing what we know today, would we would we put capital at this company? And often the valuation being ahead of traction is a, is a major consideration for us uh, and a reason that we won't follow on, even in our portfolio. Yeah, yeah because it, it kills companies and, and it creates really bad dynamics. I mean, sometimes you grow into it and, and then you made the right choice. You got less dilution, you got more capital, everything's great. The problem is for every Uber or Airbnb that keeps raising and have traction and makes it, there's some like, you know, BP in our portfolio that didn't make it because they'd raised too, at too high a valuation. And when it started, we started talking about a Dan round, there's anti-dilution provisions. It, create, it creates a mess. And, that, and often the companies die rather than doing a Dan round. Yeah, definitely. Great. So that that's the structure of the sort of standard seed series A deck that we like to see. Again, it, it I, want, I want to be clear that it is a personal decision, right? It should be made with your team and your co-founders, et cetera, on how exactly which order. But all of that content that we just went through should be in the deck somewhere. It's okay to rearrange how exactly it's presented, though. Yeah, but I like this flow. I mean, there are a few things you can change a little bit, but I'd start with the team. Um, I'd start with, like, the, the problem. I'd start with the market size kind of by default everywhere. Now, m- maybe the problem solution is presented uh, differently. I, I think all of these elements need to be there. It needs to flow nicely in the way you present it. But, uh, you know, I, I, we, we like this structure. Uh, you can change a few things, but uh, the first four, five, I would definitely keep exactly as they are here. Yeah. Yeah. So we just wanted to show you, because we talked about at the very beginning, the sort of caveats around pre-seed um, and later stage. We just thought we'd show a few additional ideas. So unsurprisingly, right, pre-seed did spend a lot more time on product, what they're trying to build. You're really pitching investors on your strategy and not your execution. You want to be clear that your past execution, what you've done the, uh, before, was really solid. Um, but being more thoughtful or detailed about how you're actually going to build the company goes a long way in pre-seed. So, for instance, here, right, we're, um, they're really going step by step through how exactly they're going to use tech to change a process that exists exclusively online. And one of the ways they're going to do that is they're going to build robust machine learning models, et cetera, to accurately price the product that they're doing. And so they're actually here going through all of the the data points that they're going to use to create these optimal pricing models. Um, You're not, maybe you wouldn't go through that in in a seed or series A deck because you actually have traction to prove that it's working, right? You're accurately pricing something. But before the launch, you're going to want to talk really in depth about how to build it. And you're going to spend a lot more time on go-to-market. And I would categorize pre-seed go-to-market as both the strategy and the timeline. So um, for marketplaces, for instance, right, we talk a lot about liquidity. Um, And building liquidity usually means you can't just be in the U.S. everywhere. You usually, for most marketplaces, are trying to. Uh, there are a lot of local dynamics, right? If I want, um, if I want to buy a piece of furniture used, I'm probably going to want a provider that's in New York City, maybe even in Brooklyn, where I am, than in San Francisco. Um, and then on the tech strategy, I want to understand: I'm giving you money for what? When are you going to launch? What are the things that are going to go into that? Um, how long does that take, et cetera? So you can see on the bottom here, I really love Silverbird sort of go live plan. I think it's really thorough. And, and helps investors get a lot of comfort around what needs to happen before they can launch. And before you go to the next slide, um, quick comment for the audience. If you have questions, uh, type it in uh, the chat and uh, we will get to them at the end, unless they're you know exactly uh, perfect for the timing we are in the presentation. But for the most part, um, w- we get to them at the end. And then later stage, right? So like we said at the beginning, you're going to be responsible for talking a lot more about detailed KPIs. Um, You might have conversations around market share because at some point you're getting big enough to have a conversation about are you actually competing with the incumbent? So for instance, Slice, our our pizza marketplace, right? They're going to talk about Domino's or they're going to talk about Papa John's. And they're starting to get to that point where it's a meaningful conversation to have. Um, And then potential M&A opportunities. So often later stage, 
you're raising equity um, partially to, to build, um, to raise debt. And you may have conversations about buying smaller players that have potential for revenue. Uh, maybe you want to internationalize and you want to buy a company to do that. And then, so the last point is at a certain point, particularly right in our European and LATAM countries, which FJ invests in a lot, there's usually an early conversation about moving across Europe or moving into different regions of LATAM. So on the left, you can see some of the metrics that you're going to be responsible for. So we are going to talk about fill rate with marketplaces. We're going to talk a lot more about repeat rate. Even NPS can be a great indication that can be not conclusive really early. Great. And then again, right, so I'm we're going to talk a lot more about cohorts, wallet share, um, revenue churn versus logo churn. So just a lot more detail um, beyond just sort of repeat rate um, and, L and net LTV to CAC. I'm going to want to understand how healthy your cohorts are because you're going to have a lot of detail now. You're going to be four or five years old, maybe. Um, and I'm going to want to understand how those legacy people are doing versus the new ones. So, yeah, and, and, and obviously, would, ideally, the been. new cohorts you know, are buying faster than the older cohorts, they're churning less because you've improved the product. And sometimes we see the opposite because you've gotten all the early, the customers that are the most logical, and now you're going to the marginal customers and things look worse. And so forward analyses and really understanding the trends matters a lot to later stage investors. And again, that's probably, probably more the B uh, onwards than, than, than before, but regardless, it becomes more and more relevant. Yeah, and it becomes more and more relevant to the point where it's got to be in your deck. It can't just be hidden in a data room or on request. It's really got to be part of the initial conversation. So, yeah, that's it. Great. Um, thank you, Kelly. Let's uh, see some of the questions for the audience. So Arno is asking, what is the minimum market size for a seed round? So I assume it's the overall market size. Um, and he's asking $100 million. So $100 million feels really low. If the entire market you're going after is worth 100 million, it feels that whatever you're building is more of a lifestyle business. I mean, you're not going to be building a billion dollar company in a hundred million dollar category. Now, if the, if the category is 100 million today, but there's a compelling story for why it could be multiple billion with the product you're bringing and because of, of general trends, that could be okay. Let me, let me give you an example. Um, we, we, we invested in a company called Rebag. It's a handbag marketplace. And, the used handbag market at the luxury level was a tiny market. You went to eBay and you added up all the like bags worth over a thousand were selling. It was maximum a couple hundred million because mostly people were afraid of fraud. They were afraid that they're buying a fake Birkin or a fake Chanel or Gucci, et cetera. And, uh, and so people were, when we met VCs in the early days, we're always like, is this market big enough? And, and so we used proxies and we're like, well, Let's look at other markets. Let's look at the car market. In the car market, there's 15 to 17 million new cars being bought every year in the US. And there's 40 million used cars. It's three to one. And in the handbag market, we have 5 billion a year of new handbags sold every year, and but only a couple hundred million in the used market. Does that really make sense? And so then we started looking at if we changed it, it could it look more like the car market. And we thought the answer was yes. And then we started looking at how much inventory is in people's closets. So if you take all of the sales of handbags from the last decade or 20 years, how much value is there there? And they were like, okay, maybe the market is small today, but it could be compelling that it's large enough that you can actually build a business here. And as the company has grown to over 100 million in revenues, those caveats and worries that people had in the early days have gone away. But you can get there. But in general, I would not go after a, a market that's only 100 million because it's too small. It's not it's not it's not bad, right? Like if you're building a mom and pop company, but I wouldn't go and try to raise venture money in order to go for that because venture outcomes, people, the VCs, they want 10x in their investment because there's so many of them that are going to die. And so they need to believe your valuation can go 10x from whatever, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, whatever valuation they invest in. So a bigger market Frankly, five billion overall sales for the category is probably on the low end. It's probably required. I think the one caveat that we've made at FJ right is, if there are winner takes all dynamics, um, we may be willing to 
consider a lower market um, TAM. So a billion, but it's going to be at least a billion. Yeah. Uh, but if you're in a, in a world where you think you can own the whole market, that's compelling. And that can be a billion dollar business. Yeah. But and, and in, because usually when you win, likely. you can then go to a different category. So in fact, I would, in general, we prefer smaller market. So to be clear, it needs to be big enough, but then we prefer smaller markets than larger markets. You know, the travel market is infinitely competitive. I'd rather, you know, it's the, the red ocean versus a blue ocean. Uh, we want to be in places that are not too competitive. So we're in TCG Player. It's a magic, the gathering marketplace. And in, it feels really niche, but that's already a multi-hundred million dollar company in a multi-billion dollar category. And they've expanded from that to Pokemon. And so you can actually, yeah, smaller markets better, but it has to be big enough. Yeah, I know, totally agree with you, uh, Kelly. Um, let's see. How to talk about market absorption index. Uh, not sure what market absorption means. I don't know if you get it, Ellie, if you want to address that. If not, we'll go to the I'm next not one. sure. Yeah. Okay. So we're typical pre-seed round sizes in health tech. Uh, question for who needs. So I'll talk about pre-seed in general, and then I'll talk about the exceptions. <laughs> so the pre-seeds in general is a team. Um, let's say it's a first-time founding team. Um, we were coming with a deck. Maybe you launched, maybe you didn't, but it's usually better if you've launched with no traction. You want to typically raise these days 500K to a million, and the pre money valuations have been three to five million. It's inching up a little bit. Now, if you're a second time founding team, you may not, you may actually skip that stage altogether, and your pre seed round might look like your seed round. And frankly, if you're an extraordinary team, your first round might look like a B. Or an A, and especially in property markets that we're seeing today. I mean, a, a founder who's been three times successful and has had multi billion dollar outcomes, next time they go out, they might raise 20 at 100 to get with to get going. But that's the exception, not the norm. The norm at the pre seed remains you're raising a million at five pre. And it was three, now it's more five. But it's kind of, it's kind of there. Now, the exceptions or the caveats is one of the categories you're talking about, like healthcare, right? If you're in biotech, or if you're in clean tech, where the capital requirements are higher, you actually see bigger seed rounds, um, if, or, and, 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 or pre-seed rounds. And often you see actually more of the bigger seeds and A's. I mean, we're investors in a company called Artemis. It's a lab-grown uh, meat company. And the seed round kind of looked like a normal seed round, but now they're going for an A, and I think their A is like 20 million or something like that, which, because it is highly capital intensive, but that, that is the norm in that category. I don't know if Kelly, you have any uh, more? Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think it depends on the capital um, requirements. We also see it in real estate, right? You're more, maybe you'd raise two to three million because you can't raise debt um, so early. And so you're buying properties or there's some reason that you need to fund growth on on equity, which is a really expensive way to, to fuel traction and to launch, but it's often the only option when you're so early, um, given that debt is a more risk um, sensitive oh. vehicle. So, so Hale actually clarified is how do you talk about market adoption? Uh, actually, the it can be part of the story because imagine you're 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 in an offline business that that is where all the transactions have been done offline. Uh, but it's a large category, and now no one's online, your pitch is we're going to bring them online. And so adopt, that could be totally be part of the pitch. I mean, think of Tool BX is like people are doing procurement through, you know, by calling up and asking for suppliers to deliver stuff. You know, adopting technology will will convert it. So absolutely, the adoption should be in the deck. I mean, imagine you're in a food delivery business today, the, and no matter what percentage of uh, food is food delivery today, I'd say 5%. There's a very compelling case for why it should go to 50%. Even though you might be very large, you can make a case you're going to be a lot, a lot larger. So adoption should definitely be part of it. Yeah, I think those generally come into play. If, if you want to talk about fill rate, if you want to talk about repeat rate, those are good ways to impress the idea that that there's adoption going on. Um, so Puneet is asking, is it a smart idea to raise via tranche-based strategy that segments the raise into three tranches with progressively increasing valuation caps and decreasing discounts on pre-money safe notes? So this feels like you wind up Y Combinator. So <laughs> this is a very common thing in Y Combinator where even though it's the same round, like day by day, they kind of increase the caps on the notes. Um, we hate this as investors. Uh, it's not the norm, by the way. The norm is 
you're raising your a, a specific amount at a specific cap and everyone's being treated the same, right? The idea that because it's two days later, the valuation jumped 30% is not one we're comfortable with and we would not do that. Uh, and nor is it the norm, by the way. It only happens in YC. I mean, I don't think I've seen it either than in YC. So no, I would not tranche it. I would, if you want to raise three, raise three, set the price that's fair and, and go for it. But I don't know. Have you seen it other, also, other than YC? Have you seen it elsewhere? You know, once in a while, you'll raise a note ahead of ahead of your Series A and it's really short or something. Listen, our thesis, right, is that fundraising sucks and it's not what you want to be spending your time doing. So to make it more complicated and to draw out the process feels antithetical to what we're trying to help you do, which is to condense your timeline make your pitch as good as possible using our resources, using our knowledge to get back to what you actually, the actual reason you started the business, which is to solve the problem you identified. Um, our, our no, a 5 billion market size is not our optimum uh, because even a $50 billion market in a way could be small. You know, the, it, by large markets, I mean like travel, it's a trillion. Food is a trillion. I mean, those are like end up being in, insanely competitive. Tread in the dump truck space is a $37 billion market. Pizza or slice is a forty-four billion dollar market. It might be forty-six billion dollar market in the US. These are these are all large enough and not too large. So I you know the optimum is not necessarily five billion, just smaller than like the entire market where everyone is going after. Right, and often people sort of fake this. Right, this is part of the reason that we like to see your thinking. Right, because if you say to me, "Travel is a trillion, so no problem. My business is big enough." not really the right way to think about it right because you're identifying a specific problem and i want you to think through that exactly as well. if you're an adventure travel marketplace you're not going after travel <laughs> you're going after right. the sub segment which is adventure travel and how big really is yeah. that and so how do you identify or how do you measure it so how the way you think about the problem actually matters to us so the way you think about market size it can't just be food is a trillion because you're not doing food you're doing something and so you need to think really about how right. big that category is and who the incumbents are and how you're going to disrupt them. Yeah, we had an entrepreneur and resident that was interested in doing sort of like wellness retreat marketplace. Um, and the problem was we, it was hard to identify how big that market, right? Because yoga is a massive market, meditation, massive market, travel, massive. But actually identifying, okay, dude, is it spas? Is it, it can be hard. Um, so you have to be thoughtful and you need to prove, and we're going to, we're going to figure that out too. So how many slides do we recommend in Pitch Deck? I'd say 15 to 20, covering all the points that we that Kelly covered in uh, at the beginning of her presentation. Yeah, and would you put the appendix or or would you put an appendix or not? It depends. I think, I, I, personally, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of appendices. I think those can be sent after. If you go out and pitch and you're often getting questions about very specific things, you can build an appendix to send those afterwards. Um, so one, you know, for Artemis, it might be more detail on the science behind how they're building the lab-grown meats, or it could be um, sales acquisition, um, going more in depth of, of how you're proving that your flywheel is working. Um, but in general, I find them to end up being testimonials, which are not that impactful, yeah. things like that. Yeah, I, I agree. Send the deck, the 15 to 20 pages with the story. Do not send the model because it's you wouldn't want it to be uh, out there anyway if people were not interested. So only send it to the people that follow up, say they're interested and want to dig deeper in the model. Um, same thing for the, if they're specific, if people want to see forward analysis or whatever, or they, they want to see the appendix, send it afterwards or create a data room that you give them access to later. Um, we didn't mention it, but don't make investors sign NDAs. They won't. Uh, VCs don't sign NDAs because we don't want to be liable because we do talk typically to like every competitor in the space. So the idea that you're going to require an NDA before someone re uh, reviews your deck is, is a non-starter, uh, and no one will do it. So, and it shows that you don't know what you're doing, and it shows you don't understand the, the category. Right, and the advantage of venture, right? It's a reputational business, so it's in our best interest to treat you with respect and treat everyone with respect because that's how we get good yeah. deal flow. And so it's it's a symbi you know. The pillars coexist together, so you should you should generally trust that we're going to do right by you because it's going to be doing right by yeah, us. Yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll talk to every competitor in the space and place a bet, but we're then not sharing all the decks with the person we that, that we with the person we're backing with all their competitors. Uh, that, that that would be that, that would be non ethical. Um, so obviously, we we do the right thing. 
but we're not going to sign NDAs because we don't want to be sued or saying, oh, you sold this idea or whatever. I mean, we literally, we get 100 deals a week. Uh, it, 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 it wouldn't work, especially since we see so many that are almost variations of the same theme. Sometimes there's ideas in the air. I don't, I don't know why, but like some idea comes up <laughs> and like everyone else, everyone seems to be coming up and doing it at the same time. How do you talk about a market when the market is not ready for your product? Uh, maybe you should not be entering the market if it's not ready yet. You should be. The why now matters, right? Like The why now matters. Yeah. I think there's a, I actually was thinking about this the other day. Uh, we got, we got pitched a, a marketplace for psychedelic treatment. Um, and clearly the world is headed towards a place where psychedelics will be uh, therapy assisted at the minimum, potentially recreational at some point. Um, and so what could be interesting about that, right, is that if you get ahead of the regulatory framework, you're in a position to really capture the market once it goes live. You're, it's going to be your responsibility to figure out how likely that is, yeah. right? Because I don't want to invest in something that's not going to happen for five years because I want my exit in five to 10 years. So that doesn't work for me. Um, it doesn't work for us. But if you're 18 months ahead of it, that's, that could be compelling. Yeah, you, you need to time it. And, and you're going to be, in this case, for instance, you need to be able to articulate your reading of the tea leaves of the legislation. What bills are being introduced? Where? When? When do you think it's going to happen? Why? And be super articulate because that's the bet. The bet is the market is not there yet, but it's going to get there in the right time frame. And the right time frame cannot be at some point in the next five to 10 years. It really has to be in the next 18 months because otherwise you're not going to raise the next round. I mean, usually we're funding you for 18 months. And so you need to, and you need to show something is happening to go and raise the next round. So really that 18 month time window matters. If the market is not ready in that time frame, probably don't launch. You don't want to be too early. I mean, think of uh, the winners are not the, the first entrance usually. They're the last entrance who got it right, right? So Google was not the first search engine. They were like the hundredth, but they were the last one that got it and figured it out. Facebook was not the first social network. They're the last one that really got it right. How do you talk about pre-signups, letter of intents, pre-launch? How should you go into the background of the early adopters? Um, so your pipeline matters a lot. Uh, and by the way, it doesn't matter a lot just pre-launch. It matters at It matters post once you're alive. S some companies, if they have an amazing pipeline and they've demonstrated that they de they they can convert twenty or thirty or forty percent of their pipeline to actual sales, we will give them credit for part of the pipeline in their valuation and their fundraise. And so things, companies that are that are small that look like they're raising a B, it may be because they have a very strong pipeline. And so I would, if, if you have a real strong pipeline, but you have to be honest with what it is. It, it can't just be, I had a conversation, they say they're interested. Um, it is valuable and I would totally put it in, in, in the deck. Yeah. I agree. Okay, great. Da, da, da. What is FJ Labs' approach in considering investing in competing businesses? So typically, we do not invest in competing businesses in the same category, in the same geography. Um, we will do companies in the same space if, if the, the first investment we made, so let's say we invested in slice of the US, and they tell us we're never going to, we're not going to Europe or Latin America, do you want it? and we see a slice of Europe, we would do that, but we would always clear it with uh would always clear to the the, main, the first company and make sure they're comfortable with it uh and in the same category in the same country for the most part we wouldn't do it the there are a few small exceptions like in non-winner take all categories um where they are okay with us doing it because actually they think it's better for the space to to grow um it might make sense so perhaps i could see us if the founders were okay with it we're not in thrasio but like multiple Thrasio type companies because they're, they, 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 they would grow that category. I could see that happening, but for the most part, we don't have asking competitors. You know, recently, for instance, we looked at in the last few years, we've been pitched and we're an early investor in ClearBank. We've been pitched a lot of ClearBank of Europe and a lot of ClearBank of Latin America. And they told us, no, both of these we care about. We're going to go in these geographies. Please don't do it. And so we, 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 we listen. Likewise, we're investors in Rebag. It's a handbag marketplace. But they told us in the future, at some point, we're going to go in jewelry. Don't do anything in jewelry. Don't do anything in diamonds. And so even though over many years, I mean, we could have invested, I think, in true facet at the very beginning. at like, I don't remember the valuation, like 4 million pre. And it would have been a 20x, 50x investment. We didn't do it because we respect the, the, 
the decisions of our founders. Now, that said, they have to be reasonable. It can't be, oh, I'm in whatever. I'm in, I, I, I'm doing pizza and you can't do any other food delivery ever in any country in any geography, right? Like it needs to be articulated why it is really your path and that would be competitive. But for the most part, yeah, we don't invest competitors. I know there's more nuance uh, you want to add to that. No. Uh, I think, you know, the, the truth is sometimes things converge over yeah. time, but given that we're early, we're working with the information that they have and the strategy that they have now. Um, but it certainly prevented us from continuing to invest going forward as models shift and, and conditions change to make seemingly non-competitive companies feel more competitive over yeah, time. Yeah, so that does happen. <laughs> Absolutely. We invest in companies that are doing different things and they converge in one model and they end up competing. Um wouldn't matter too much. I mean, we're not, we wouldn't be sharing information between the two companies anyway, uh, or insights. And, uh, and, 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 but yeah, it does happen. Eh, we do really keep the Chinese wall going anyway. I deal with companies that require funding in order to have inventory uh, before they can prove their product market fit. The reality is, you, you can probably do it with very little capital, right? Like, imagine. To get to your seed round, you know, the difference between your pre-seed where you have zero revenues and your seed where you had 150K, or at least you're going in that direction. Even if you can get 50K in sales, you know, to get a 50K in sales, you don't really need that much capital. So I could imagine that if you raise your million pre-seed, which is the norm these days, you're raising a million pre-seed, that should be enough money for inventory. Uh, that said, we don't like inventory-based businesses and we don't like hardware. Uh, <laughs> The, they have tended to seem to become commoditized and have their margins compressed. So it wouldn't be the type of business we'd like to invest in, but you could totally do it if you need to. Yeah, I think it's sort of what I said before, right? There's a chicken and egg where sometimes if you need assets, you're going to fund it with equity in order to get debt down the line. And debt is the right way to do it. Um, but it, it, it can take some equity up front uh, in order to prove traction so that debt providers actually want to invest in you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, usually you're going to use equity in the early days. No, no bank is going to lend you at the very beginning where you're this uncertain company. And, but eventually, yes, inventory should be funded from debt. If you're, if you're a marketplace for loans, ultimately the loans should be provided by loan providers or capital providers, which is debt again. You shouldn't be lending off a of balance sheet. But Pre-seed, seed, you know, even partly for part of the A, if part or, or all of the equity <laughs> or, or of the inventory and or of loans are provided from equity, that's okay to prove that you have great unit economics and it's okay. What are the key financials that you need to insert into your pitch deck? Why did you take it? <laughs> Definitely, again, it's... It's a little bit about which model you're taking, but but for marketplaces, we want to see GMV, and then we want to see net revenues. Um, we can you can we can figure it out, right? If you tell us your take is fifteen percent, we can take your GMV. Um, but it's easier. You're trying to make people <laughs> excited about you. Um, one thing I didn't say, but I really don't like cumulative GMV. You should show it month by month or whatever. Don't, don't make a hockey stick where no hockey stick exists yeah. um, just for the sake of it. And then we want to, see, we care about unit economics. So that's generally average order value, take rate, which would be good to gross margin. We want to talk about variable costs, non-variable costs associated with that, your customer acquisition side on both demand and supply. If we're talking about a marketplace, retention, repeat rate, LTV, um, which should be net LTV. Yeah. So if you're early month to month, DMV, uh, net revenues, um, make a lot of sense. Like we want to see really month to month. If you're like four years in and you're at your series C, we do want full year financials presented, uh, but I don't need it. What, what, let me tell you what we don't want to see. We don't necessarily, we don't need to see a five year projections for the future. Um, frankly, if we could see this year and maybe next year where you expect to be, and it matters because we want to make sure you're at the right place for the next stage. Yes. Beyond that, we're not going to believe anything you present. Uh, and, and even the numbers you present for, you know, let's say now we're in March, I do want to know where you think you'll end up in December, but I've that month of December, and I do want to have a sense of therefore what your full year of this year, 2021 looks like and what your full year 2022 looks like. I'll give you some credit for it. And then I'm going to, we're going to drill down. How are you going to get there? What do, what needs to be true for those numbers to happen? And so we can like kind of get a sense of probability, but what we do not need to see is a five-year projections with a full business plan 
you know, because I can make Excel tell you tell me anything if I want to <laughs> go from a million revenue to five billion. Yeah, doesn't mean anything. Right. It can only hurt you. Right. I, I like the there's a there's a big correlation between people who show me revenues five years out and also tell me unreasonable expectations. But <laughs> right? you're not going to be a billion dollar company in three years. There are very few companies that do that well. Yeah, I mean, look, the reality is that you need to be intellectually honest. We don't know, right? It's a startup. We don't know how big the market really is at the end of the day. We don't know how much we're going to grow. But if you have compelling stories of like, these are the tactical things we're doing, we're going to spend a little bit more marketing. And we think we, you know, because this is a CAC, this is what it's going to lead to, you know, and therefore there's a real reasonable path to 3x. That's fine. You don't need to be 10xing per year or 100xing. And, and, Telling a story that you go from zero to like, you know, a billion in revenues in five years is not believable and not, not and actually decreases your credibility. Um, just tell us where you're going to be at the end of this year. What do you expect to be next year? But back it up. Like when we dig deeper into why you think you can get there, you know, you're going to have to be able to explain it. And also probability weight is like, oh, yeah, no, this is my baseline or this is my aggressive case. What I really believe is thus. I mean, and by the way, I would I would prefer you put your baseline case and your where you end the year and where you be you want to be next year, not your aggressive every star in the multiverse alliance. And this is what it's going to take to get to to get there. I mean, I actually we didn't talk about that. What, is it, do you agree with that perspective, or would you rather they show aggressive numbers in their in their ambitions for the end of the year and next year? a good question I, it really comes down to the found you know the founder and how much credibility i have with him and so if he's going to lead me in a direction um a lot of how i'm going to assess whether that's reasonable or not is the trustworthiness the competency that i get from the pitch conversation or the relationship i have with the founder so um if you come off nervous i'm gonna have i'm maybe gonna question your assumptions and uh, Solar Feeds Marketplace says fundraising sucks. It actually does. I mean, it, it, people don't realize if you're a founder CEO, you probably spend 50% of your time fundraising. Uh, the, real, it, it, the equivalent of like the Alec Baldwin always be selling is like it's always be raising in a startup world because you're losing money. Until you're profitable, you're always raising. So you may have just closed your seed round. You're already thinking about your Series A and every action you take goes in that direction. So you're always raising until the magical day of profitability and sustainable cash flow profitability on a go forward basis. And then you're freed from, from the tyranny of needing to raise. But yeah, most CEOs, 50% of their time is fundraising. And so you needed, that's why I want you to run effective processes. That's so you can go back to what you should be doing, which is like executing on the business. I think that's why a lot of preempts happen, right? It's because founders just don't want to go back out into the market and they're willing to take a, something that they feel is reasonable. But even the best companies in our portfolio, we still will make 20, 30, 40 introductions for. So it's not, it is, it's not about talent that makes it faster, right? It's really, a, it's a grind. Um, yeah. And it happens for the best CEOs and the worst CEOs. Even companies that end up being massively oversubscribed and getting five term sheets, they got 45 no's, you know, we made 50 introductions. And the reasons you get the no's can vary. It's just like, they they don't believe in the category. This morning, uh, they woke up on the wrong foot and they were, they were in a bad mood. And so they ended up passing. I mean, you don't really know. And, it, and just don't take it personally. You're gonna get a lot of no's. Uh, you throw a lot of spaghetti in the wall until it's sex. So you just need to meet the person who believes in you and your story and has your back. Uh, but that's why don't raise too little capital. You raise money and you're out of cash in 10 months, you have to go back raising in two months because you need to be raising kind of eight months before you cash yeah. out. So not only would I raise enough for 18 months, I'd probably have a buffer in there as well. Like these things don't always go according to plan. And and I mean the default plan, not the every star in the multiverse alliance plan. So, you know, if the capital is there, make a little bit more dilution, raise 20% more. You are not going to regret it. Uh, the In a few cases, you'll... You won't need it, but in the case you need, you'll be grateful and happy that you have the extra buffer. Uh, it also removes Sorry. pressure when you're fundraising. It gives you a bit more time to get the right term sheet. Yeah. Yeah. You went out to raise three and you ended up raising four. Great. You, know, you went to write. <laughs> I think any founder in 2020 was like, I'll take, <laughs> I'll take every cent I can get. Um, yeah. And, and imagine that you needed to go fundraise in March or April of 2020, frankly, you were screwed. 
<laughs> money was not available. Valuations were bad. I mean, if you had raised enough money that you could like wait until September, you were in a much, much, much better position. Okay, I think uh, we've covered every one of the questions, one of the most interactive uh, sessions we've had. So, uh, Amazing. yeah, people seem to have loved it. So, thank you, Kelly, for uh, doing this. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Fabrice. Okay, I'm well, excited to be asked. Yeah, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll see you in the next show. Bye.